This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Farmers Insurance, how can I help you? Yeah, hi. I wanted to uh, cash in my home insurance policy. Are you who I need to talk to about that? Uh, but what do you mean by cash in? Do you need to file a claim? Oh, no. I just, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe. Has your home been damaged? Um, no. No, but it, it will be. Uh, no, uh, I, I mean, wait, this is, sorry, this isn't an insurance fraud thing. It's just that um, I know that the world is going to end eventually, and there's no way that my house is going to survive that. So I was thinking maybe I could just go ahead and, uh, you know, collect on that. Yeah, uh, our policy doesn't cover acts of God. Well, there's nothing religious about it. I mean, there, there's lots of different ways that the world could end. Are you expecting this sometime soon? No, uh, actually, that's that's uh, something else I wanted to talk to you about. So the the nearest it would happen would probably be about fifty thousand years or something like that. And so I did a little bit of math, and it looks like with inflation, my house would probably be worth like five trillion dollars. So um, I was thinking maybe I could get that from you. Yeah, uh, we can't we can't do that. I'm sorry. Are you sure? Because I mean, this seems fair to me. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I've seen Isaac Arthur's video, and he proved that we could survive the end of the world, so. You uh, saw Isaac's video, huh? Yeah. And it looks like your house is going to be fine. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, I'm, actually, no, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I was uh, Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Bye. Damn it, Isaac! The Earth is a rare jewel in the cosmic expanse, the only planet that we know of that can harbor life. But all it takes is one good disaster to put the kibosh on all that. Today I'm talking about the top five ways that the world could come to an end, and I'm super excited to be doing this as a collaboration with my buddy Isaac Arthur. Many of you guys out there I know are fans of his and his channel Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and uh, a lot of you guys have been asking for a new collaboration with him for a long time. Well, your dreams just came true, jabronis. So I'm going to talk about all these different ways that the world could end. Isaac is actually going to talk about how we could possibly survive it, so at each point in the video when I talk about those things, I'll put a link up here where you can go to that point in his video. I'll bring the anxiety and Isaac will be a nice soothing balm of optimism. So let's do this. So when we talk about the end of the world, we're usually talking about the end of us as a species, which is a very human-centric way of looking at it. Fact of the matter is the Earth was doing just fine without us for 99% of its existence. Many would argue it would be a lot better if we weren't here. So one of the mandatories for this list was that when we say the end of the world, we mean the end of the world or at least the end of all life on this planet. I'm talking about turning this planet into an uninhabitable hellscape. You know, like every other planet in the universe. And Texas in August. Now again, don't freak out too much, don't get too anxious. At the end of this video, you can go watch Isaacs and find out how we can survive all these. Keep hope alive! All right, without any further ado, let's start destroying the world. Our first doomsday scenario is gray goo. When we talk about the dangers of AI, we talk about artificial superintelligence possibly becoming sentient and deciding that it needs to wipe us all out. This is still a concern, but maybe something we should also be concerned with is artificial stupidity. You hear somebody say that they're just smart enough to be dangerous? That's what I'm talking about. Because long before AI becomes the godlike superintelligence that can solve all of our problems, it's going to be just smart enough to cause a lot of problems. The Grey Goose scenario is all about nanotechnology run amok, specifically self-replicating nanotechnology. Self-replicating machines are often attributed to the mathematician and physicist John von Neumann, though he's not the only person who helped popularize the idea. There's also Freeman Dyson and K. Eric Drexler, who first coined the term Grey Goo in his book Engines of Creation. Now, in some ways, self-replicating machines could be a great idea. They could even be key in the growth of our species. If we had an autonomous self-replicating robot, we could send that to the asteroid belt and it could build the machines required to mine the asteroids and in no time we could have a whole army of autonomous robot miners. The problem with self-replicating machines is it has to eventually stop replicating or else it becomes sort of exponential and takes up all the resources. Kind of like cancer. Shrink all this technology down to the nano scale and you've got a real problem. Or as Drexler put it in his book, imagine such a replicator floating on a bottle of chemicals, making copies of itself. The first replicator assembles a copy in 1,000 seconds. The two replicators then build two more in the next 1,000 seconds. The four build another four, and the eight build another eight. At the end of 10 hours, there would be not 36 new replicators, but over 68 billion. In less than a day, they would weigh a ton. In less than two days, they would outweigh the Earth. In another four hours, they would exceed the mass of the sun and all the planets combined. 
if the bottle of chemicals hadn't run dry long before. So technically, within a matter of days, tiny nanorobots could consume all the biomass on Earth, transforming the landscape into a smooth grayish goo. Hence the name. Now there's a couple of different ways this scenario could happen, uh, both of them horrifying. The first is as an ultimate doomsday weapon, either from an alien species or from a super intelligent AI that decides to wipe everybody out, or from a state actor who wants to kind of hold the world hostage. This does sound like something out of a Bond movie, actually. The second is more accidental. Imagine if we came up with nanorobots that could, say, clean up an oil spill, and then something goes wrong and they decide to just consume all the carbon-based objects. Either way, the whole gray goo thing is often cited as a danger when we talk about nanotechnology and self-replicating machines. Luckily, Isaac has a way of surviving this gooification over in his video. The next doomsday scenario is a runaway greenhouse effect. Now, I know we're all on board with the global warming thing. I know it's not a contentious thing at all. I'm sure in no way will I be receiving 10,000 word comments in all caps just for mentioning it as a possibility. I'm sure that's not going to happen. It's going to happen now. But if it helps to calm your tits about the whole global warming thing, let's just take humans out of the picture completely. And let's just, for now, talk about something that happens that tips the scale and knocks the climate out of balance. And again, not enough to make it extra hot or to raise the sea level a little bit and threaten a city or two. I am talking about enough to wipe out all life on this planet. Can't happen, you say? Ridiculous, you say? Well, guess what? It's already happened. On Venus. Now the first thing that everybody's going to say when they hear about Venus being hot is that of course it's hotter, it's closer to the sun, which is true. But the surface of Venus is actually hotter than the surface of Mercury. Actually, the surface on the night side of Venus is hotter than the daytime side of Mercury. Venus's temperature has everything to do with its atmosphere. And its atmosphere sucks. It's impossible to overstate how insane the atmosphere on Venus is. It's so thick that only 20% of the sunlight that hits it actually gets to the surface. Most of it gets trapped up in its 97% carbon dioxide atmosphere. The pressure at the surface is 90 times the pressure here on Earth. In fact, it's the same pressure as a thousand feet below sea level. It would crush you like an aluminum can. And if you were an aluminum can, it would melt you. In fact, the pressure is so great that it's not even really air. It's more of a supercritical fluid. Did I mention it rains sulfuric acid? It rains sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid that never actually even reaches the surface because it's so hot. And yet it's believed that earlier on in its history, Venus was a lot more like Earth. Earth got its water from somewhere, and most scientists agree that it came from a raining of billions of comets that hit the Earth during a period called the Late Heavy Bombardment. But we weren't the only planet that got hit. It's not like billions of comets missed every other planet and only hit Earth. It rained down on Venus and Mars as well, which means that they once had water just like we do. On Mars, with its extremely thin atmosphere, that means all that water froze in underground lakes, like the one that was just discovered by the ESA Mars Orbiter. But on Venus, it's believed that the water lasted somewhere between 200 million and maybe a billion years, and then something changed. It's thought that periodically throughout its history, Venus has had these periods of massive volcanic activity, and we think this because the surface of Venus is actually very young. It's only like 500 million years old. Now on Earth we have tectonic activity, where plates are constantly being pushed back underneath the crust into the mantle where it melts under there in a process called subduction. And just like stirring some hot liquid causes the cooler liquid on top to cool off the warmer liquid down below, this has the effect of sort of cooling off the mantle. And we also see regular volcanic activity on the borders of these plates that kind of helps release the pressure underneath. Now Venus doesn't have tectonic activity like we do, so it's thought that periodically that pressure and heat underneath gets to be a little bit too much and it explodes out of the surface through thousands of volcanoes covering the surface with lava and flooding the atmosphere with greenhouse gases in the process. So it's thought that Venus used to have water and an atmosphere a lot more like ours and then there was a sudden burst of carbon dioxide from underneath the surface that trapped a lot more heat. This wound up boiling off the oceans which put a lot of water vapor in the air which also traps a lot of heat. And with nothing on the surface to break down this carbon dioxide in the air it just kept growing and gathering and turned into the hellhole that it is now. Now that's a lot of info about Venus, but the question here is, could that happen here on Earth? The good news is not likely. We do take in less heat from the sun because we are further away from it than Venus is, but we also have the carbon cycle, which removes carbon dioxide from the air, kind of keeps things regulated. Let's just go with that tiny chance for just a second. What if enough carbon dioxide flooded our atmosphere that it overwhelmed the system? Either through our activity or through a rash of super volcanoes or through the biggest cow fart in the history of the universe, somehow, the CO2 in the atmosphere tips the scales and we go into a series of positive feedback loops. 
The CO2 in the atmosphere raises the temperature enough to eventually thaw the permafrost in the northern hemisphere. This permafrost releases methane that's been trapped underneath the ice for thousands of years. Methane is a much worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide even, so this raises temperatures even more, enough to start to evaporate the oceans, which releases a lot of water vapor into the air, which warms up things even more. And all the extra CO2 in the atmosphere gets absorbed into the oceans, which starts to kill off marine life. Dead marine life decomposes, creates methane, releases that into the atmosphere, things get even warmer. And while plants may grow bigger initially because of the extra CO2 in the air, uh, it eventually gets too hot for them to grow. So the plants start to die off. This reduces the amount of carbon dioxide being taken out of the air, which causes it to build up and build up even more, making things even hotter. It eventually gets so hot that water can't exist in liquid form anymore. It all gets evaporated up into the atmosphere, which makes the pressure at ground level the same as at the bottom of the ocean, because all the ocean is in the air. And pretty much all life would cease to exist. Fun while it lasted. The bad news is that while this is extremely unlikely, it is sort of possible. The good news is Isaac has a way for us to survive it over in his video. Save us, Isaac Arthur! The third on our list is a good old fashioned comet impact. Comet and asteroid impacts are staples of sci fi and disaster porn movies, mainly because we know it actually happened once before. That's what wiped out all the dinosaurs, but it didn't wipe out all life on Earth because we're still here, even if Triceratops is not. The Earth has proven to be remarkably resilient to impacts from outer space. We actually got hit with a Mars-sized object early on in the solar system. That's actually how we believe we got our moon. We're still here. Although I don't think the Theia impact could really be considered an extinction level event because that would imply that life was here on Earth before that happened, and I don't think that's the case. I think we were barely even a planet at the time. The asteroid that did the dinosaurs in 65 million years ago was about 10 kilometers wide, six miles across, and it created the Chicxulub Crater on the Yucatan Peninsula of modern day Mexico. If that happened today, here's what we could expect. First off, anybody in a thousand kilometer radius would be immediately turned to ash like so many Avengers after the snapture. And these would be the lucky ones. The impact would kick up thousands of flaming boulders the size of houses and rain them down all over North America. Within hours, a 200 degree Celsius blast wave of dust and debris would roll across the United States, setting every home, building, tree, and blade of grass on fire and then burying it all under a pile of ash and debris. Earthquakes measuring up to 11.5 on the Richter scale would rattle the entire planet and set off thousands of volcanoes. Mega tsunamis would push the ocean inland by hundreds of miles. For example, me sitting here in Dallas would probably get hit by a wave of water dozens of meters tall. And with all this tectonic chaos, hydrogen sulfide from deep within the Earth would seep through the Earth's crust. And hydrogen sulfide does a neat little trick when you breathe it. It makes you stop breathing. So that's one, two, three, I've lost count of all the nightmares. In the months and years that follow, the dust and debris cloud along with continued volcanic activity would shroud the entire planet in darkness, killing off all vegetation for likely the next 1,000 years. But we would still probably survive this. We have bunkers and seed vaults from the Cold War days to help us survive something like this. We might eke by, but it would be bad. So all that human carnage is great and all, but we're not talking about something survivable. We want to wipe out all life on this planet. What would that take? Our best calculations show that it would take a rock about 96 kilometers wide or about 60 miles wide. This would be enough to destabilize the entire planet and basically turn it back into a giant molten rock. Luckily, there are no near-Earth objects in our solar system that are anywhere near that size. That we know of. <laughs> Next calamity on the list is a gamma ray burst. What is a gamma ray burst? Well, a gamma ray burst is a large burst of gamma rays. I'll get more specific. Gamma rays are the most energetic type of radiation on the electromagnetic spectrum. Their frequency, their wavelengths, is actually so small, they're smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So whereas things like x-rays and ultraviolet can kind of mess up molecules in your body like DNA, uh, gamma rays can actually scramble atoms. Getting hit by a gamma ray will not turn you into the Hulk. It'll bork you up. It'll bork you up something good. It shouldn't really be a surprise that the main sources of the most powerful type of radiation in the universe comes from the largest and most powerful objects in the universe, things like neutron stars and supermassive black holes. And sometimes when the cosmic unstoppable force meets the cosmic immovable object, their magnetic fields actually kind of line up together and it fires both of those objects worth of gamma rays in one narrow beam. This is a gamma ray burst. Imagine about 5% of all the energy the sun will ever generate being fired into a laser beam. This makes the Death Star look like a cat's toy. 
This insane beam of energy can travel hundreds of thousands of light years across the universe, dispersing and weakening as it goes. So what would happen to us if we got hit by a notorious GRB? Well, technically, we get hit by them all the time. Scientists detect gamma ray bursts almost on a daily basis, but they're always from distant galaxies really far away. They're not posing any threat to us. They just appear to us as little bursts. Although it should be noted that we only notice GRBs that are pointed directly at us, which means that there are probably hundreds of thousands of times more of them out there than we even know about. But what about a nearby gamma ray burst? Could that cause an extinction level event? It may already have. Some scientists believe, and this is not settled by any means, but some scientists believe that the Ordovician extinction, which took place 450 million years ago, one of the top five extinction level events in Earth's history, may have been caused by a gamma ray burst. Most of the life was in the ocean back then, but the Ordovician extinction knocked out 85% of the species on the planet. It's the second largest mass extinction in Earth's history. While there are several hypotheses about how this happened, one of them involves a gamma ray burst from a hypernova explosion about 6,000 light years away. This wound up wiping out the ozone layer in our atmosphere, which let ultraviolet light come in completely unfiltered, wiping out all the species on the surface of the ocean. This atmospheric carnage led to glaciation and an ice age that made things 10 times worse. So if that happened again, um, it would suck, but we would probably survive. But what about a much closer GRB? A close enough GRB would literally fry one whole half of the world, which would obviously kill everything, it would set everything on fire, this would set off weather phenomena that would wreak havoc all over the planet. The smoke cloud would darken the sky, not letting anything grow, while ultraviolet light streamed in and wiped out everything else. It would be bad. Luckily there are no GRB producing objects close to us in the Milky Way that could actually do something like this, so we're, we're pretty safe from that. And last but not least, our number one way for the world to end is the death of the sun. The reason we made this one number one is because of all the scenarios we're talking about here, this is most likely to happen. In fact, it's guaranteed to happen. As I mentioned in my video called A Brief History of the Future, the sun has another about five billion years of hydrogen left to convert into helium. Once it runs out of that hydrogen, it blows up into a red giant phase, which estimates vary, but it should come out pretty much right to where our orbit is. And at that point, the Earth is gonna be toast. But hey, if it makes you feel better, it's gonna be uninhabitable way before that. Because the sun will actually slowly get warmer over the next billion or so years, increasing by about 30 to 40%, enough to boil off the oceans and making it impossible for anything but the hardiest extremophiles to survive. And the tardigrades shall inherit the earth. So even if we avoid all these catastrophes, we're still doomed. Or are we? Before you slip into a never-ending cycle of anxiety and depression, head over to Isaac's video and he'll cheer you right up. He explains how we could actually survive the sun going supernova and all these other calamities as well. Oh, and by the way, if you like this channel and you like what I talk about here and you're not subscribed to Isaac's channel, why, 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 why? Isaac takes the type of topics that I talk about here and he gets super granular with them. He really breaks them down into these 30 minute long deep dives that are just amazing. They will blow your mind every single time. He takes science fiction concepts and breaks them down and shows you how you could actually make this happen or how we could make this happen as a society. And it's, and it's really cool. So if you are not following him, do go follow him. He's a great guy. And if you really want to know more about our universe and our place in it, you gotta go to Brilliant.org. Brilliant has a whole course on astronomy with more than 350 guided problems and explanations that'll give you a better understanding than everyone around you. And I can tell you, being smarter than everyone around you, it's pretty good. Like I'll sit here and tell you that scientists think that we got hit by a gamma ray burst 6,000 light years away, but Brilliant will actually explain to you how they figure that out. And they do it by walking you through puzzles and games that lets you figure it out on your own in a way that makes sense to you. And this changes everything. You'll be watching my video and Isaac's videos and instead of going, oh, you'll go, oh, that's called a nerd O-face. Sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And the first 200 people that sign up for a premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses will get 20% off for life or the end of the world, whichever comes first. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel and for supporting so many other really cool educational channels. They're really investing in helping making the world a smarter place, and that's super awesome. Also, a huge thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, helping me do what I do, and creating just an awesome community. I'm really enjoying hanging out with all you guys. We do have some new people that have joined the tribe. Let me murder their names real quick. We've got Chad Hingston, Jeff Castellucci, Draghi Rios, Walter Enrique de Souza Ferreira del Silva. 
Ah, you thought you screwed me up. Uh, Rick Laviette, uh, Gal Bar Orr, Laura Sanborn, Chris Davis, Burt Newman, James Floyd, and Zev Fleetwood. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to stuff that other people don't get access to, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please like and share this video if you like it, and if this is your first time here, or if you came over from Isaac's channel, please check out some of my other stuff. You might like those too. I talk about topics like this all the time. And if you do like it, uh, hit the subscribe button. You'll be the first to see my videos every Monday. And if you are subscribed, hit that bell. You'll join the notification squad, and you won't miss anything. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now and have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.